Judges and turn to Judges chapter 3, page 202. Uh, we've got a few Bible. All right. All right. All right. So we've been in Judges for about four, five, six weeks now. So now we finally get to a judge. Uh, this is our first time getting to an actual judge. Um, off the uh, Remember, these aren't guys in black robes, gavels, on eerie cases and trials. Uh, no, the judge was more of a uh, deliverer. It was a savior. They're often military um, leaders, um, people who God used um, to rescue his people. Why? Why did they need rescue? Well, because God's people had rejected him and rebelled against him. And as we've been seeing, that always brings with it consequences. Uh, I've mentioned this recently, but I've always kind of struggled with the idea and wondered why the penalty for sin was death. Man, what's the, come on, that seems a little harsh, right? What's, what's the big deal? But then it kind of dawned on me, it's perfectly logical, right? If, if God is the author and he is the giver of life, then to reject him is to reject life, which means that we are embracing death, right? So we have all willingly and freely chosen death. That actually makes um, complete sense. And this is what we've been seeing Israel do repeatedly, and they're going to do throughout this whole book. We've talked about how their main problem was idolatry, which is our same problem. You are an idolater, and I am an idolater. Not bowing down to small little statues, but loving something more than God. We've all seen, we've all got that thing that gets us out of bed in the morning. Um, that thing that drives us and motivates us that we must have um, to give our lives um, meaning and to give us an identity. That thing's supposed to be God, that's how we were designed. We've rejected Him, we've replaced Him with all kinds of other little G gods, right? Sex, relationships, pleasure, jobs, money, power, importance, whatever it is, we all have something um, that we most value, that is most important to us. And whatever that thing is, it is your God. So as we've been seeing here, God has just done everything for Israel. He's gone in and He's rescued them, He has protected them, He has provided for them, and they have returned the favor by rejecting Him. And now this morning, we're going to see once again what God does about that. We're going to see again the problem of our sin and what God does in response to that. How God saves. And I want to focus especially on the part, if any, that we play in that process. What do you have to do to be saved? What do you have to do before God will rescue you? And this passage will show us, and I want to look at it in terms this morning of repentance. Right? Because I think that's something that we often get wrong. And that's something that I um, have often gotten wrong. So this morning we're going to skip um, verses 1 through 6. Um, so don't even look at them. Uh, we're going to come back to them in two weeks for Anniversary Sunday. Because I think they're going to fit well um, with that theme. And today we're just going to look at verses 7 through 11. Our first short passage in Judges. Um, so we don't have to read for five minutes um, before we can get um, to the message. And if I'm going to be completely honest with you, I was... I was tempted to skip this passage because it's actually a little bit boring. Um, well, let's skip this. I wanted to get to, to Ehud. Um, the next passage is like, this guy's an assassin. He's got a dagger strapped to his leg. And he sneaks in and he, he stabs the king. And there's just all this descriptive, weird language. And it's just this great um, account. And this one's a little, eh, there's nothing here. But, but as I really started to study it and, and look at it, um, man, I learned something that I had been getting wrong and that I had been really um, missing that really helped me to better understand um, God's grace. Um, and that's my hope for you guys here this morning. This kind of nondescript passage will give us a fuller glimpse of who God is and what He has done for us. Right, let me read it for you first, um, and then we'll continue. Judges chapter 3, starting in verse 7, just through verse 11. This is the word of the Lord. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asheroth. Therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the people of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. So the land had rest 
40 years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Let me pray for us, um, and then we'll continue. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you especially for obscure little passages like this um, that we've never paid any attention to, Father, and we um, skip over. I, I thank you that there is great truths and great depths um, to your word, and I pray that we would see that here um, this morning. I pray that you would speak and work through your spirit in this time. Father, my words are weak, um, but your words are strong, and I ask God. Um, you uh, would use this time um, to give us uh, a new perspective, a new awareness, a, a fuller glimpse of who you are, um, and a bigger and better appreciation for Jesus Christ and um, his work in our place. We pray all of this in his name. Amen. Amen. All right, so verse 7. Again, we start off focused on us, our initiative, our evil. Forgetting God, um, Israel. Um, they have gone after these other gods. They have, they have spit in the face and they have rejected um, the one who has given them and done everything for them. He loved them. He protected them. He provided um, for them. And he's, listen, he's rightly offended. Um, I would be offended if this was my daughter's response to a life of love, protection, and provision. But again, that analogy barely begins to get to the issue here because I, I'm not God. I'm not the creator. I'm not the lawgiver and the Lord, the, the infinitely valuable and honorable one. That's who Israel is rejecting and rebelling against. And actually, his first response makes a little bit more sense to me than his second response, though people struggle with this. Because in my mind, it's, just, it's logical. It's justice. God is holy. He is righteous. He is just. As any good judge should punish Crime, the judge must punish crime as well. Wrongs must be made right. Um, sin incurs this debt that must be paid. So we first, at the beginning here, see God respond to their sin, and He responds in anger. And as we said a couple of weeks ago, anger is not the opposite of love. Anger is often directly a result of love. Anger is often an expression of love. If someone that I love is making a bad decision, is addicted to drugs and alcohol or, or whatever, destroying his life, I should be angry about that. that. That anger is an expression of my love for that person and my desire for their good. So God is here likewise angry at Israel and their choices. He wants their good, right? He knows what's best for them and he knows that it's not um, these false gods and these things that they are pursuing. So he does something. He, he acts. He, he responds to their sin with just judgment. They want to pursue these false gods. So what does he do? What's his response? He basically, he lets them. He, he turns them over to the nations of these false gods. He said, this is what you want. All right, these are the gods you want. Here you go. All right, that's sometimes the worst judgment that God can give is that he gives you exactly what you want and turns you over to it and says, go for it. Have at it. That's what we see in Romans 1. So he turns them over to this king of Mesopotamia, Kushan Rishathaim. Listen, I tell people when they're reading scripture, just go for it. Just be confident and people will believe that you know how to pronounce it. I don't know how to pronounce it. I don't know how to pronounce that name. Um, so I'm just guessing. Um, but you believe that I thought that I knew how to it. Right? It's actually a name slash title. It's Kushan. It's a name. But that Rishathaim is actually a title. Um, and it actually in Hebrew means of the double evil, or of double wickedness. Right? That was not his last name. Right? Think of like Ivan the Terrible. Right? That wasn't his name. He was, his name was Ivan, and he was awful, so they again gave him that title. Well, that's this guy as well. This is a bad dude. And he is the king of Mesopotamia, and that's a noteworthy fact. And everything from here on out that, that Israel's going to deal with, every other leader that they're going to have be troubled with, is kind of more of a local, regional, kind of little king or power. This guy is big deal king over international um, power. Kind of, this would have been the precursor to, to Babylon and Assyria. Some people think the fact that he is Kushan of the double evil means that he's the king over the empire that's going to become Babylon and Assyria, the two evils that are going to most um, give Israel trouble in the future. But whatever it is, this guy's, uh, this would have been the most powerful threat that Israel faces in this entire book. And God gives them over into this king's hand for eight years. Right? So that's kind of the intro to the story, what's going on. And here's where I need to repent. And I need to repent for getting repentance wrong. Because studying this was very enlightening for me. And it kind of was very eye-opening and kind of gave me great calls to worship. And I hope it will do the same for you. We spent a couple weeks introducing this book and I've explained to you how there's a pattern to judges. Right? The same thing 
happens, and then the same thing happens, and then the same. There's this, this four step pattern that I gave you to explain the different cycles of this book. And here's what I gave it as I like alliteration, so I said it was rebellion, retribution, repentance, and restoration. All right, the people reject, they rebel against God, He punishes them, that's retribution. Then they cry out in repentance, and then in response, God restores them. Well, I actually want to, I want to amend um, that four-step process, and I want to confess that I think that I got that wrong and, and correct it. Well, and I think the one that I got wrong is that third R, repentance. And what I want to do is completely remove it. Because here's what's fascinating. That repentance is not part of the cycle at all. And here's where we begin to see that. Right? Verse 9. The people cried out to the Lord. Now, I just kind of had just always breezed over that and taken that to mean repentance. Uh, as they were, right, they had sinned, they were now suffering, they are like, oh no, this is terrible, we've rejected God, and so we're going to turn our backs on our sin and now go back um, to the Lord. But that's actually not at all what is going on here. Nothing like that is mentioned. Right? The Hebrew word here for cry out is rock, and it means a cry of deep Distress. It's a cry of pain from some sort of terrible circumstance. Um, in over 60 uses of this word in the Old Testament, the word by itself never carries with it any sense of repentance. Right? These people aren't penitent. They're miserable. Right? There is no repentance happening in these verses. So what is that? Let's step back for a second and talk briefly about there's, of course, another one of those Christian words that we throw out with all, without often being able to define it. What, what is repentance? And how I have generally understood it, and how I was always taught, and how most people understand it, is that we think of repentance in terms of behavior. Right? To repent is to stop sinning. So here's how we think about it. You have to repent and believe to be saved, so you turn from your sin, you stop sinning, you believe in God, and as a result of you stopping sinning and believing God, then God saves you. Right? And that's how we generally understand what's going on here in Judges. The people sin, God punishes them, the people stop sinning, so God saves them. Listen, that's simply not at all what is happening here, and that's not at all what happens in salvation. The Greek word metanoia um, for repentance literally means a change of mind. Right? What repentance is, more biblically and accurately, is that repentance is a new perspective. Repentance is a new awareness. I think about it like this. I grew up in the South. Um, uh, different world, um, you know, 30 years ago. We grew up in a little cul-de-sac lot and we were just completely surrounded by woods um, and nothing else. Um, so, I got to do whatever I wanted. Um, I grew up in the woods. We, we played in the woods, um, roaming around, doing whatever, playing in creeks. You guys call them creeks up here? Is it creeks? Is that a thing? Okay. What's your that was southern? Cricks, um, some people say. Um, but we just played. It was different. My parents didn't supervise us. They weren't worried about us. Just go play in the woods. They even let my brother and I, unsupervised, take a chainsaw into the woods and cut down trees and, to make a path, right? It seemed like they were barely, um, but we, we were fine. Uh, we, we knew um, what we were doing. Um, so we played a lot in the woods, and I just grew up outdoors. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever experienced this, but there is something simple and just kind of therapeutic about throwing rocks. I don't know if I love throwing rocks. Um, I still love um, throwing rocks. Um, and you don't get a whole lot of opportunity to do that here in New York, um, except a little while back, um, a while ago, I went out to put the trash out late one night. Um, I, I went and tried to do it in my boxers. Um, not the best idea. It was late. No one was awake. No one would see me. Just quick out and back in. Um, no need to waste time putting on pants, right? Well, of course, what happened? Right? The one time I tried to do it, the wind blows, the door closes behind me, and I'm literally standing on the sidewalk at midnight in my boxers with the door locked. I'm not kidding. Um, so what did I do? I quickly took a rock throwing again, right? I'm throwing rocks at Melissa's window. Throw rock. like, please, please, please. Um, and I took a few rocks, and she finally heard it. She came out. Um, she delivered me from my shame. Um, <laughs> that's not the point. I don't know why I wanted to tell that story. Um, but I love throwing rocks. Um, and as a kid, I loved throwing rocks. And, and again, think about it. As a kid, you're pretty dumb, right? So, you know, we'd find a tree way off in the distance. And we'd be like, all right, who can hit the tree first with this rock? Or you'd be on a hill. You'd be on over a cliff. You're just throwing rocks. You're not even thinking about it at all. And I have clear memories of a couple of times my mom telling me, because we're in the mountains or something doing this. She's like, listen, stop. What, what are you doing? You, you have no idea if someone's 
down there, or is at the bottom of that cliff, or over that hill. Stop throwing rocks, you, you could be hitting um, someone. So imagine if I'm as a kid, I'm just here throwing rocks over some blind cliff, but then someone runs up, comes yelling up the hill, says, stop throwing rocks, there are children down there getting hit by your rocks. What's happened? Right? We have been given, I have been given new information. Right? I have been given a new perspective. I have been given a new awareness. Before this new information and after this new information, the, the action was the exact same. Right? It was throwing rocks. But where previously the action was desirable and fun and harmless, this new perspective changes that. Right? What would, we would immediately drop the rocks. I don't desire to hurt little children. It's not fun to hurt little children. And the action is most definitely now not harmless. So once we are given this new perspective and this new uh, awareness, we no longer want to throw the rocks, right? We've been given this change of mind. And that's exactly what repentance is. Repentance is first and foremost a change of mind. And it is that change of mind then that gradually leads to a change of behavior. It is a changed and new awareness. Whereas previously, I loved my sin. I desired my sin. I thought it was good, harmless, fun. Now, all of a sudden, I'm given this new perspective, and I start to dislike that sin. I eventually start to hate that sin. I see it for what, it's really, for what it really is. I see how much it harms me and others, and how much of offense it is to God. And then, with this new perspective, I slowly start to desire sin less. I actually begin to sin less. But that action, that behavior, sometimes comes a little bit later, and sometimes comes very gradually. That doesn't mean I haven't repented because the mind has been changed um, and then the, the action and the behavior slowly follows. Right? That's, that's repentance. So do, do you see why it's problematic to think of repentance as just a change of behavior? What would that do if that's what repentance was? Listen, it would make our salvation according to works, right? We get our act together. We stop sinning. God sees that and He's impressed, and so He saves us. No, right? That's, that's not at all how it works, and that's not what's happening here in Judges. The Israelites are not repenting. They are in pain. They are justly suffering the consequences of their sin, and they are crying out in misery. And listen, this distinction was so helpful for me to see. God is not responding to their change of behavior. I want you to get that first and foremost. So at the very beginning, we got to see Israel is not repenting. But then we see what God is doing in response to their not repenting. Look at verse 9. The Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them off the Right, so God gives Israel into the hand of Cushan. Now he gives Cushan back into the hand of Othniel. And he defeats this great and powerful king. He frees the people. And he gives them 40 years of rest. The end. That's, that's it. Right? That's, that's all we're told. This, this story of Othniel is pretty bare bones. It's, it's a little bit boring. It's lacking any interesting detail. But with every one of the other major judges that is to follow, we're going to get all kinds of sordid details and intrigue and suspense and murder. They're just great stories to read. But not this one. Right? This one's different. This one is the outlier. This one um, has the least detail. And we're told nothing about Othniel. Why? Why is that? What's the author doing? Well, listen, he's doing it on purpose. He, he intends for Othniel and for this first judge to be the mom. Right, this is the, the paradigm. The author is setting up this basic account to be the control against which the following accounts will be judged. Right? This is how it was supposed to work, how it was supposed to go. You guys know what Pinterest is, right? Everyone knows Pinterest um, these days. Um, it's like this online bulletin board kind of thing. Um, I don't know how to describe it. I don't use it. Um, you collect pictures of things you like and you pin them like it's recipes and crafts and clothes and cool ideas. Um, you know, Melissa loves Pinterest, and I'm not going to lie, thus I love it then too because I have benefited greatly from many a Pinterest recipe. Um, but, but the things that end up on Pinterest, if you've ever checked it out or looked at it, they're always perfect. Right? They're, they're skillfully done by very talented people. So you should go home this afternoon and I want you to Google Pinterest fails. Have you ever seen these? Right? There are, some things on Pinterest are so perfect, um, they're, they're so hard and well done, that often when regular people like us 
um, try to go and make these things, our attempts end up looking nothing like the original, right? So someone makes a cake that looks like Elmo or something, and then someone's like, oh, I'm going to make that cake, and it looks like this melting, terrifying <laughs> monster. Um, and they put the two pictures together and it says, Pinterest fail, right? That's, you know, they're really humorous, but that's actually similar to, to what's going on here, right? Othniel is the model. We're told nothing negative about him. He does nothing wrong. He's God's standard of what the judges were supposed to be like. But more and more, the judges that are to follow, Gideon and Jephthah and Samson, are each going to get worse and worse and worse and further and further away from the model that they were supposed to um, match. We're told nothing about Othniel. But there's going to be a whole lot more detail about each of the judges to follow. And it's not going to be pretty. The more the judge becomes the focus, the more we're specifically told about the judge, the worse things get. Right? As the judge becomes the focus, his sin can't but help to become the focus. As the judge becomes the focus, God becomes less and less the focus. So in this first ideal account of Othniel, in the paradigm, nothing is said about the judge himself, meaning the focus isn't him at all. It was never supposed to be him. The focus is supposed to be completely on God. Right? The credit doesn't go to the judge at all, but it goes completely to God. But once man and these judges start to become more and more the focus, everything falls apart. Because they are sinners just like the rest of us. So, if you take these last two points, right, that the model um, of Othniel emphasizes God as the actor and God as the Savior, and you combine that with the fact that he is saving them, not in response to any sort of repentance or turning from their sinful ways, it shows us a very, very important truth, which is that we contribute nothing to the salvation process except for the sin that makes that salvation necessary. Right, so here in these verses that I had always skipped over and I had always ignored, we get this little glimpse behind the curtain into the utter graciousness of God. Right, not gracious as in courteous or polite, no, a much greater graciousness. Uh, gracious in that He generously and liberally dispenses His goodness and His favor to those of us who have absolutely zero claim on it and who have done nothing to deserve it. Listen. Israel deserved to be cut off and damned um, for their sin. And they just keep trying to get cut off. I deserve to be damned and cut off for my sin. And you do too. I wasn't repenting. I wasn't cleaning my act up. But the gospel that we get a little bit of a picture of here is that God is a God of mercy and grace. He is a God of kindness and forgiveness. And here's the really good news that we see here in this passage. He doesn't wait for us to act. First. He doesn't wait for us to repent and get things together. No, our God is a God who initiates. It is a God who steps into the picture and asks first. I don't know if you see this, but do you recognize how totally unique this is? The gospel is the exact opposite of every other religion out there. Because everything else is basically teaching you the same thing. Right? They, they kind of set up a ladder for you of some sort, some rituals you've got to do, pray five times a day, say so many Hail Marys, um, do, uh, go on a two-year mission. Well, whatever it is, every one of these religions are about pleasing God by doing these various things for Him. God looks down and says, all right, I see your trouble. Here, I'll tell you what you can do. You do those things, and then you can get to it's all about you and about what you do. Pray a little bit more, give a little bit more, do, 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 do. Be a good person, let your good outweigh your bad. Climb and ascend that ladder to God. But we're in church, right? We're, we're the Christians, so we kind of nod along, agree. Yeah, okay, everyone else out there, it's all works righteousness, we're different. But, but are we, right? Do we really understand how earth-shatteringly different this is? And that's why this repentant realization was so helpful for me. I had been preaching judges incorrectly. I don't have any problem admitting that. I was unthinkingly preaching the very thing that I had been constantly preaching against. But this is how most people understand it. Right? This is how you're going to hear it elsewhere. It goes like this. right? You're pretty bad, but don't worry. Things aren't hopeless. If you'll just repent, if you'll just turn away from your sin and believe in God, then He will save you. I said, that sounds right, doesn't it? it it's, cause it's what we're so used to hearing. But I want you to really think about this. If this is our message, then our message is no different than the message of the world. 
Right? Repentance, talk like this, is not the gospel at all. It is works righteousness. You figure things out. You turn from your sin. And if you do it, God will then save you. But what would be the basis of that salvation? You. And what you have done and chosen. And that's not grace at all. What we see here, what I desperately want you to get is that the gospel is so much better than that. The gospel is so much more beautiful than that. And that's what Judges 3 shows us. It's this, this the sheer grace of God. Israel sinned. God rightly punished that sin. Israel was miserable as a result of that. That's all we're told. They didn't stop sinning, which means they kept sinning. But what happened next? God intervened. Right? God saved. Grace, right? Not because they did something to deserve it, but solely because He is loving and kind and merciful. If it's about you repenting first and then God responding in salvation, then you just borrow the ladder from the rest of the world and set it up in hopes of climbing um, your way up to God by something that you do. But it won't work. It won't do it. And that's simply not the gospel. It seems so subtle, but it is often subtlety that is the most serious. Right? This one small little difference changes everything because it actually makes salvation dependent upon man, which then makes salvation impossible. Right? In the account of the rich young ruler in Mark 10, the apostles cry out to Jesus. They say, then, then who can be saved? And to which Jesus replies, with man, it is impossible. You can't do it. There's nothing that you can do. But there are so many people out there claiming to speak in the name of Jesus that are saying that it is quite possible, right? Just believe. Just turn from your sin. It's up to you. It's according to your will. You have the power and the ability. If you initiate, God will respond. No. Go read Judges. Where God waiting around for Israel to get things together and repent and to choose to believe and follow Him, it would have never happened. Right? Israel proves that over and over again, they would have never gotten it right. Remember, the whole point of this book is to bring us face to face with the depths of our sinfulness and depravity. Last time in chapter 2, we saw what happened when God raised up judges for them. What was their response? Judges 2.19. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and they were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods. Right? Well, that's, that's what they do. That's, that's their initiative. And don't forget that we are Israel in the story, right? Israel represents us. We would have done no differently than they do. Left to ourselves, this is what we do. This is what we choose. We love our sin. We love to go our own way and do our own thing. We don't want anyone telling us what to do or what to not do. So we, we run. We, we run from God. because It's because we know Him and we are aware of Him that we run. Because we don't want to have to give up control and submit to Him. So if our salvation is dependent on our, on our will and on our getting things together and repenting from sin and turning to God, it's never going to happen. And Israel proves that here. But that's why the gospel is so different and so brilliant and beautiful. In everything else, even in most Christian theology, we act first and then God responds. But Judges 3 shows us a better way and the only way. The gospel is an entirely different order. There is there's something called the, the ordo salutis, which is just Latin, which means the, the order of salvation. Um, and there's a disagreement over what that order is. And I grew up believing, as most people do, that the order is, well, God gives a little bit of grace to everyone. Um, then it's up to us to do with it what we want. We either reject it and we repent or we repent and believe. And if we repent and believe, if we figure it out and choose correctly, then God will respond and regenerate us and save us. But listen, what does that make salvation dependent on? What's the difference between me and a non-Christian? Me. It's my superior understanding. It's my superior choice. I figured it out. I chose correctly. Thus, I get some of the credit for my salvation. Right? In some way, I am better or smarter than that person who didn't repent and believe. But that is works. That is not grace. Israel didn't repent first. Israel couldn't repent first. And we can't either. Romans 8, 7 says that our minds are hostile to God and that they do not submit to Him because they cannot submit to Him. Then verse 8 says that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says that the natural person does not accept the things of God. He is not able to even understand them. 
So according to Scripture, on our own, we are unable to understand and unable to submit to God. And that's what we see here with Israel's repeated failure. This is who we are. Sinners, rebels against God, with no desire or ability to repent and return. It's terribly depressing, isn't it? Right? The book of Judges is terribly depressing. But it's so important that we're confronted with this and that we actually wrestle with this. Why? Well, it was because until we actually understand how bad the bad news is, we will never appreciate how good the good news is. And until we understand how sinful and powerless we are, we'll never appreciate how kind and able God is. Until we rightly understand ourselves, we will never fully appreciate Him. They didn't repent first. And you didn't either. And you can't. But the good news of Judges chapter 3 is even better than the bad news is that God saves sinners anyways. Right? God initiates. God acts first. That's what we see here with Israel. And that's what we see in salvation. God acts first and then we respond. There's a really important verse that I think gets overlooked in a lot of this. And it's Romans 2.4. And Romans 2.4 says that God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. Not your repentance is meant to open up the way for you to access God's kindness. If you repent, then you can get God's kindness. No, it's His kindness given to you and freely bestowed to you that then opens up the way and brings you to repentance. His kindness comes first. His action and His grace comes first. And then we respond in repentance, as the verse says. 2 Timothy 2.25, Acts 5.31, Acts 11.18, they all talk about um, God graciously granting and giving to us the gift of repentance. But repentance, like faith, like our articles of faith says, is the fruit of regeneration. It is the gift that God gives to His people. He acts first, He intervenes, He saves us, regenerates us, He opens our eyes, giving us this new awareness, and then we respond graciously in faith and repentance. Go back for a second to the, to the rock throwing illustration, right? I was just a dumb kid who loved throwing rocks. Uh, I didn't have it in me to think wisely enough about the stupidity of my actions. Like, unless someone else is there, I'm like, just throwing rocks, it's fun. I'm not thinking about the consequences. Uh, I couldn't give myself the needed new perspective. So what had to happen? Right? Someone else had to come in from the outside and give to me this new perspective. They had to open my eyes to what I was really doing. I needed someone to step in and save me from what I was doing and the harm that I was causing. Listen, that's what we read earlier in Matthew 16. That's why we read that passage. I've been wondering why, why are we reading um, this, this confession. No, it's important because Peter didn't just figure out who Jesus was. Peter wasn't just smarter um, than everyone else. Oh, good job, Peter. You figured out. You're the best. No, it says specifically, Jesus says to him, no, you didn't get this. This was given to you. This was revealed to you by God. That's grace, right? Peter was given new information. He was given a new perspective. And that new awareness changed how and what he saw. And it's no different in salvation and repentance. Ephesians 2 8 says clearly that this is not our own doing, it is a gracious gift. Of God. Romans 9.16 says that it depends not on us, not on human will, but on God who has mercy. That's, that's grace. That's, that's our message. Judges 3 is a picture of the gospel. It is God taking the initiative and saving sinners, though they wanted nothing to do with Him. Listen, so whenever I struggle with this, whenever I'm talking to someone about it, what I always do is I always go back to Paul. Right? And we're going through Acts and Wednesday night Bible study, and we'll get to Paul in a couple of weeks. But Paul is the perfect picture and the perfect model of what we are talking about here. Right? Who, who was Paul? Well, first of all, he was Saul, um, and he was a terrible person. Right? He was a murderer. Um, he was um, actively persecuting the church. He was, he was on his way to, to, to throw more Christians in, in jail, to have more um, Christians killed. Right? Paul is not seeking after the Lord. Paul is not cleaning up his life. Paul is not repenting. Paul is going in one direction, doing specifically what he wants to do. And what happens? Right? Paul has a miraculous encounter with Jesus Christ. Right? Paul is wanting to do this. Jesus Christ and says, no, no, no. You're going to do this. Jesus shows up and rescues Paul. And he steps in. He reveals himself to Paul. He opens his eyes by literally he blinds him, closes his physical eyes, 
opens his spiritual eyes, and then that Paul sees clearly, now he's got this new awareness and this new perspective, then he responds in repentance and faith. God goes and gets and saves Paul. God goes and gets and saves his people, Israel, here in Judges chapter 3. They're not going to get him. They're not going after him and pursuing him. God saves sinners. Right? That's, that's the message. That's, that's the story. We don't save ourselves. We don't contribute um, to the process. He comes after us and does for us something that we would have never done for ourselves. Do, do you understand that? And do you understand what understanding that can do? Because it can change everything. Right? This understanding for me is just so beautiful and attractive to, to such a terrible sinner. Right? I don't have to clean up my act. First. I don't have to figure things out before I can come to God. Why? Because He has come to me. Right? That's what's remarkable. He has come down to a terrible sinner like me. He didn't wait for me to get things together so that I'd be ready and worthy um, for Him. No, He came after me and He rescued me and forgave me and restored me and accepted me. But do you know what that means, right? All those terrible things that you've done, right? those, those things that nobody else knows about, that you are terribly ashamed of. Well, if this is true, that means that even those things do not prevent you and keep you from the grace of God. Right? One of my favorite verses is Psalm, in Psalm 103 where it just says so beautifully, God does not deal with us according to our sins. Man, that's, listen, that's my only hope. Um, because if He deals with me in any way according to my sins, I'm done. Uh, I deserve nothing. Um, but here we see He's not waiting for us. He's coming for us. Right? We do not climb up to Him, but He has literally descended down to us in the person of Jesus Christ. That is a radically different message. Right? This is a God who takes the initiative and comes after sinners and saves sinners. His action comes first, and then we respond. Right? That's, that's different. If you put your action first, you've got an entirely different message. Right? You're preaching a different gospel. Right? Because He has been waiting and dependent upon you, and salvation is according to you. Right? Jonah 2 9, salvation belongs to the Lord. Right? He's not waiting on us. He is mercifully rescuing us um, through the work of Jesus Christ. Right? Jesus is the true and the better Othniel. Right? God uses Othniel to free Israel. Jesus shows up onto the scene in Luke chapter 4. He grabs Isaiah and he, he, he basically summarizes his ministry reading um, from it and says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Right? That's what Jesus brings. That's what He does for us. Liberty. Good news. God's favor. And He does that all for you, though you did nothing to deserve it, and though you did not seek it yourself. That's grace. That is grace. Him giving you something that you did not deserve or desire. Right? Your sin is so serious that it incurs this debt that must be paid. A, a death debt. Well, Jesus came to pay that debt for you by dying that death for you. He has settled your accounts. He has set you free. And once you start to understand that, and once you start to understand that the fact that you did nothing for it, you're finally going to start to love Him and to appreciate Him. And it's that new, bigger, fuller love that's going to crowd out all these other loves that dominate um, your life. And that new, bigger love is going to shape you and transform you and change you. It's going to give you a new joy and new meaning for life, a new fulfillment and this new relationship. And so that's what we see here from Judges chapter 3. I want us to, well, our goal is always to look at Israel, to see ourselves in Israel, to see our great sin, but then for, to, to, to let that um, force us to look much longer and much deeper at, at God who loves and pursues such sinners. To look at Christ who, who became one of us, who became like us, um, so that he could die in our place and represent us. And that's that's grace, right? And He did it for you freely. Um, and our goal is to see that and be amazed by that and let God's grace um, change us and transform us. And so bow with me and let me close on our time. Father, I thank you for the gospel uh, according to Judges chapter 3, um, the good news um, that you, um, we're not waiting for us, uh, Father. You're not trying to uh, let us figure 
um, things out first. You're, you're not hoping, you're just kind of crossing your fingers. But Father, you are pursuing us. You are running after us, Father. You are saving sinners. Uh, that, is, that is my only hope. Um, that is uh, our only hope. So I pray that we would just see and be astounded by the utter graciousness uh, of you. Uh, and you would understand um, Jesus and what he has done for us, Father, though we didn't want it, for we didn't um, deserve it. You have settled our accounts. You have paid our debts and set us free, Father, so that we can repent, not in hopes of earning your favor, but we can repent because we already have your favor, because we've already been um, rescued and reconciled um, to you. So that we now then desire to live a life um, that honors you and that glorifies you, you have acted on our behalf, and you have acted um, first. So, Father, I pray that we would see and understand. Um, Father, help us um, to recognize our sin. Uh, Father, help us to recognize um, so much more how, how bigger your grace is um, than our sin. And your grace and the blood of Christ um, covers it all and pays for it all. Father, just give us a new and greater desire um, to know him and to follow him. Father, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.